this this banking, uh, I'll call it anxiety rather than a crisis, uh, if it leads to a Minsky moment in lending, and if it leads to some institutions to have to draw back on loans, it's doing exactly what the Fed set out to do when it started raising interest rates and when it started uh, selling assets from its portfolio. But look, raising interest rates didn't make a big difference to consumers or businesses when cash balances are so high after the stimulus programs during the pandemic. And uh, drawing back uh, reserves from the banking system with QT, that didn't make a difference to lending either because the system was over-reserved. But now we have this Minsky moment and we have some banks losing deposits with liquidity issues. Uh, we're going to see, I think, the Fed I wouldn't say welcome what's going on, but certainly appreciate the benefits to their objectives, which has to be, at the end of the day, if they're going to bring inflation down with monetary policy, it has to be to at least slow the economy substantially, if not to cause a recession. Uh, Carl, very good morning to you. I've been loving, for a start, the, the copy that uh, Rubila Faruqi, your U.S. chief economist, has been sending us. So thank you very much indeed for that. And, and something very logical in there that doesn't seem to me to be a Minsky moment, but seems to be more of a, a drip feed of a problem rather than a sudden withdrawal of credit. And this is the fact that Rabila has been talking about the fact that if you say, I mean, I'll use my example of, say, let's say there's a million dollars on deposit at First Republic, and suddenly that depositor says, no, I'm going to put it, um, at, I don't know, Citigroup or JP Morgan. That money isn't necessarily the same money available then to be lent out again, because um, the banks that take on will become more cautious uh, and more conservative in their lending criteria. So the crisis might not necessarily lose any money for depositors in the net, but actually where that money is put and then how that money is used creates actually tighter credit conditions. That's basically the argument, isn't it? Absolutely, Steve. And we have to remember that the job of the bank regulators is to protect the public, not the shareholders. So while I feel bad about all of these COCOs and AT1s who are losing their money, right, this is what the system is designed to do. People who invested in banks put money at risk, and with that risk comes risk, all right, that things could go bad. A depositor who puts money in a bank expects that money to remain available, expects the bank to be a public utility, if you will, that holds their money safely and keeps it available. To the, to the extent that the regulator's job is to protect the depositors first, we have 100 percent perfect gold star for the execution that we saw in the United States, at least, and probably in the case of First Boston uh, of Credit Suisse, when it's all said and done. The depositors are safe. The investors lost money. Main Street is protected. Wall Street took the risk, lost in this particular case. It's, it, to me, this is a, a perfect example of regulation. And I'll add one more thing, Steve, to that, all right? What did people expect would happen when the Fed started tightening monetary conditions or the Bank of England or the ECB, all right? The intent here, what that tightening of monetary conditions means is that some businesses are going to suffer and some of the financial institutions are going to suffer from that also, from the dislocations that are caused by that. So at the end of the day, you know, this is what we're getting, what we should have expected all along, which is that businesses are failing and that's helping to slow the economy. And that's what brings aggregate demand back into line with aggregate supply.